Ada for refusing full custody of my daughter after my husband asked for a divorce? I, 31F, have been together with my husband Alex, 33M, for seven years, married for four years. Alex was always really excited about the prospect of children from the beginning of our relationship. I was always on the fence. I've seen how hard single moms have it. I promised myself I'd never be in that position. Plus, I work as a software engineer. I love my career and I didn't want to give it up to be a mom. After Alex and I got married, those fears went away. We were very much in love, I felt safe with him, I told him my fears and he said all the right things to make them vanish. So we tried for a baby and had our daughter Ramona two years after we got married. The pregnancy and first year with the baby was extremely hard on me. I had multiple health problems during and after the pregnancy that were life-threatening and altered my body permanently. I was disabled and nearly died once in the six months after I gave birth, and during this time my husband grew distant and became angry frequently when we'd speak. I spent a lot of time in and out of the hospital and was unable to work, so a lot of the baby care went to him during this time. It was all I could do to stay alive and get better, being separated from my daughter and husband so much. Eventually I did get better enough to help more with the baby, but after I was discharged from the hospital he barely spoke to me. I want to clarify early that at no time did I ever neglect our daughter if I was able to care for her. I leaned on him a lot during this period, but I was also fighting for my health and my life so that I could continue to be there for her. If I had pushed myself too hard I would have made it worse or be dead. We stayed in a state of limbo like this for a while. I was still in recovery not back to 100% yet but able to resume a somewhat normal life and we shared more responsibility with Ramona. I tried talking to him many times over the next six months, but it was more of the same thing. He wouldn't speak to me, or he'd get angry in every little thing I did, insist I was making things up and blame me for somehow criticizing him. It was a constant deflection from whatever was bothering him. I got another job about nine months after the pregnancy, and things seemed to improve for a while, or at least I thought. Not long after Ramona's first birthday, Alex served me with divorce papers. He said he'd fallen out of love with me a long time ago, and he was ready to start anew. I was in shock. Things had started to improve between us, but he explained that was because he decided to leave and he felt less unhappy. It was a Saturday when this happened so I made sure he was going to be home to care for Ramona for the weekend, then I packed a bag and left until Sunday evening. I didn't say where I was going, and truthfully I didn't really go anywhere but drive. I drove two states over by the time I stopped. I needed to think. When I got back Sunday evening, he was pissed I'd left him alone with our daughter. He's always seemed really put off any time he had to care for her alone, this time was no exception. I sat him down and very carefully said, I will grant you a no-contest divorce, but I am not accepting full custody of Ramona. If he was only pissed before, he was explosive now, and everything he hated about me finally came out. That I was a horrible mother. That I wasn't strong enough to even be a mother. That I was too weak to carry a child and now I was abandoning her. I very calmly stated that I loved her dearly and would not abandon her. That I would pay child support and visit her every other weekend that I would be there for her in any way I could, but I had been very clear with him when we got married that I would never be a single mom. He became borderline violent at this, grabbing things like he was going to throw them and screaming that I was ruining his life on purpose. I wasn't going to stick around to be talked to like this, so I went and checked on Ramona, gave her a kiss, then grabbed my bag and left again. A couple days later his mother texted me. He'd left Ramona with her for a few days, and she had some nasty things to say to me. That a mother should never leave her child, etc. I told her it wasn't her business, and that her son doesn't get a free pass to restart his life because his wife nearly died when she was pregnant, and he became resentful with the responsibility. He's also blown up my phone asking me when I'm going to come back so you can take your daughter, but I've only replies I've already told you what's going to happen here. I love my daughter immensely, and I will be a provider for her, I will always support her, but I won't be her primary parent. Continuing from where we left off, Ramona became the center of a complicated and painful situation. After the divorce was finalized, Alex was given primary custody as agreed. I would see Ramona on weekends, just as I had promised. At first, 
I did everything in my power to make those weekends special for her. I'd take her to the park, we'd go to the zoo, and I'd make sure she felt loved and cherished. But as time went on, I noticed something deeply troubling during our visits. Ramona began showing signs of anxiety. She would cling to me when I dropped her off at her father's house on Sunday evenings, refusing to let go, her small hands gripping my coat, her eyes filled with tears. When I asked her what was wrong, she wouldn't say much, but it became clear something was off at home. Alex had never been particularly good at being a hands-on parent, and now that I was out of the house, it seemed his resentment towards the responsibilities of fatherhood had grown. I tried to talk to him about it, but he dismissed my concerns as paranoia and guilt. He insisted everything was fine and that I was just looking for an excuse to disrupt his new life. It wasn't long before I learned from neighbors that Alex had started leaving Ramona alone at home for long stretches, often claiming that his work was too demanding or that he needed a break. Ramona was too young to be left unsupervised, and I feared for her safety, but every time I confronted him, he grew defensive, accusing me of trying to sabotage his parenting. Things came to a breaking point when one weekend, I picked up Ramona, and she was unusually quiet. Her clothes were disheveled, and she seemed exhausted. When I asked her about it, she hesitated but eventually told me that she'd been alone for an entire day. Her father had left early in the morning and didn't come back until it was dark. She was only five years old. I was horrified. I immediately contacted Child Protective Services, and they began an investigation. Over the next few weeks, it became evident that this wasn't an isolated incident. Alex had been neglecting Ramona more frequently than I had ever imagined. His work, his new social life, and the desire to move on had taken precedence over his responsibilities as a father. And Ramona, my sweet little girl, had been paying the price. The authorities stepped in. Alex was warned multiple times but failed to improve his behavior. The final straw came when a neighbor called the authorities after seeing Ramona sitting outside the house alone, waiting for her father to return for hours. Child Protective Services made the heartbreaking decision to remove Ramona from Alex's custody, citing neglect. I tried to fight for her, but my previous refusal to take full custody worked against me. I was deemed unfit to be her primary parent because of the choices I had made. It was the most painful moment of my life to realize that despite my love for her, I had contributed to this outcome by not stepping up when I should have. The guilt was suffocating. Ramona was placed in foster care temporarily, but soon, a kind, loving couple expressed interest in adopting her. They had been unable to have children of their own and had always dreamed of a family. I met them briefly during the process, and while it broke my heart to know that I couldn't be the mother she needed, it gave me solace to see how much they adored her. Over the next few months, I watched from the sidelines as Ramona blossomed in her new home. The couple who adopted her, Emma and David, treated her with the love and attention she deserved. They were patient, kind, and understanding of everything she had been through. They made sure she never felt alone or unloved again. Ramona's new life was filled with joy, trips to the beach, family game nights, and a stable, nurturing environment. She started school and made friends, and slowly, the scars of the past began to fade. I continued to visit her, though it was less frequent as time went on. I knew deep down that she had found her real home, a place where she was safe, cared for, and truly cherished. Though it pains me every day to have lost the chance to raise my own daughter, I find comfort in knowing that she is happy that she has a family that can give her the stability and love I was unable to provide. I will always be there for her if she needs me, but I also know that Emma and David are the parents she needed all along. Am I the asshole for refusing full custody? Maybe. But I've come to accept that sometimes love means making the hardest choices. And though I couldn't be her mother in the way I'd imagined, I'm grateful that she's with people who can be. After Ramona moved in with her new adoptive parents, I initially felt a sense of freedom, a release from the constant worry and responsibility that had weighed on me since her birth. I thought that I could finally move forward with my life, focus on my career, and heal from the tumultuous years of battling for my health and my marriage. But that feeling of freedom was fleeting. It didn't take long for a profound period of self-reflection to set in. 
The guilt and doubt I had tried to push aside started creeping back into my thoughts. Had I made the right decision? Could I have been a better mother if I had tried harder? The initial relief was quickly replaced with a heavy, gnawing emptiness that I hadn't anticipated. I missed her deeply, more than I could ever have imagined. To my surprise, Ramona's new parents, Emma and David, were incredibly understanding. From the start, they were open to the idea of me staying in her life, though I had assumed they would prefer to keep their distance. They recognized how important it was for Ramona to maintain some connection to her past, and they believed that fostering that connection would help her transition and heal. What started as occasional visits turned into something more regular. At first, I would visit Ramona once a month. These meetings were filled with awkward silences and nervous energy on my part, mostly. I wasn't sure of my place in her new life. I didn't want to confuse her or disrupt the bond she was forming with Emma and David. But Ramona didn't seem confused at all. She embraced our time together with open arms and a joyful heart. It became clear that what mattered most to her was that she was loved. Whether it came from me or her new parents, love was the constant she craved. As the months passed, these visits became more frequent, at the gentle encouragement of Emma and David. They weren't threatened by my presence. In fact, they welcomed it. I think they saw how much it meant to Ramona to have me in her life. She never stopped loving me, even after everything that had happened. I was still her mother, even if someone else was now raising her. The more I visited, the more I realized how much she had flourished under their care. She was happy, truly happy. Her eyes sparkled with joy whenever she talked about school, her new friends, and the trips they took together as a family. And yet, when we spent time together, she would still hold my hand, look at me with those big eyes filled with love, and tell me about her adventures as if nothing had changed between us. It was as though her world had expanded to include more love rather than replace what had been there before. For Emma and David, it was strange at first to navigate this unconventional relationship. They had expected that once they adopted Ramona, they would be the sole parental figures in her life. But as time went on, they realized that the more people who loved her, the better. We all had our roles. I wasn't her primary caregiver anymore, but I was still important to her. They saw the benefit of this unique bond and supported it fully. Over time, what began as tension and unease between us grew into a deep mutual respect. Emma, David, and I didn't see each other as rivals or adversaries. We had different places in Ramona's heart, and that was okay. Ramona seemed to thrive under this shared love, becoming more confident and secure. She had a village supporting her and she knew it. The more frequent visits meant that Ramona had the best of both worlds. She was deeply loved by Emma and David, who provided her with stability, care, and a sense of home. But she also had me a link to her past, someone who loved her just as much, even if I wasn't there every day. It was a strange arrangement, but it worked for all of us, especially for Ramona. Watching her laugh and play during our visits, I felt a warmth in my heart that I hadn't experienced in a long time. I realized that while I hadn't been able to be the kind of mother I had imagined, I could still be part of her life in a meaningful way. I could still love her, support her, and watch her grow. In the end, the love that surrounded Ramona was the most important thing. She didn't care about the complicated history between her biological parents or the details of why things had turned out the way they had. All that mattered to her was that she had people who cared for her deeply and that she was never alone. And in this, I found a kind of peace. I had made mistakes, many in fact, but I was still here for her in whatever capacity I could be. And that, I realized, was enough. As time went on, the rhythm of our strange, blended family became routine. Ramona was thriving. Emma and David were the perfect parents and I had found a way to remain a part of her life, even if from a distance. It seemed like everything had finally settled into a peaceful equilibrium, until one day, everything changed. I had come over to visit Ramona on a quiet Sunday afternoon. Emma invited me in with her usual warm smile, and we sat down in the living room, chatting about Ramona's upcoming school play. Everything seemed normal, but I noticed that David was unusually quiet. He kept glancing at Emma, and there was a tension in the air I couldn't quite place. Eventually, Emma cleared her throat, her voice trembling just a little. 
We need to talk to you about something, she said, her eyes searching mine with an intensity one hadn't seen before. My heart sank. Instinctively, I feared the worst. Maybe they had changed their minds about me being in Ramona's life. Maybe they wanted to cut ties, to give her a clean break from her past. My mind raced through all the possibilities as I waited for her to continue. Emma took a deep breath. There's something we haven't told you, something we only just found out. David finally spoke, his voice low and serious. When we adopted Ramona, the agency gave us some background information about her family, but they didn't tell us everything. Recently, we learned something that might change how you feel about her adoption. I froze, my mind struggling to comprehend what they were saying. What do you mean? What haven't they told us? Emma exchanged a glance with David before continuing. We found out that Ramona's biological father is an Alex. For a moment, I couldn't process what she was saying. What? That's not possible. Alex is her father. We did a paternity test years ago when she was born. Emma shook her head. That test was faulty. The agency ran a new one during the adoption process, something they routinely do for records, and it came back with a different result. My pulse quickened, and I felt a strange mix of disbelief and confusion. If Alex isn't her father, then who is? David handed me a piece of paper, an official document from the adoption agency. As I scanned the page, my eyes landed on a name I hadn't heard in years. It was the name of an old friend from college, someone I hadn't seen in over a decade. We had briefly dated, but it was a part of my past that I had long buried. I had never told Alex about that time in my life because it had seemed so irrelevant by the time we met. My hands shook as I stared at the document. This can't be real. Emma's voice was soft. We were just as shocked as you are. But it's true. He's Ramona's biological father. A wave of emotions washed over me. Anger, guilt, confusion, and a deep sense of betrayal by fate. How could this be? My entire life with Alex, all the pain, the struggle, it had been built on a lie I didn't even know existed. I sat there in stunned silence, my mind racing. What did this mean for Ramona? For me? For her new family? Should I tell her? Would it change anything for her if she knew the truth? David's voice cut through my spiraling thoughts. We've decided not to tell her right now. We think it's best to let her grow up with a family she knows and loves. But we wanted you to know the truth, so you can decide how you want to handle it moving forward. I nodded numbly, still trying to absorb the enormity of the revelation. As I sat there, watching Emma and David exchange worried glances, I realized something important. Despite the shocking truth, despite everything I had just learned, Ramona's life hadn't really changed. She was still loved, still happy, still surrounded by people who cared for her. And that was what truly mattered. I took a deep breath and looked at them both. I agree. We won't tell her. Not now. Let her have the childhood she deserves. But as I left their home that day, I couldn't shake the feeling that everything had shifted beneath my feet. There was now a secret that hung in the air, one that I would carry with me for the rest of my life. I didn't know what the future held, but I knew one thing for certain. Ramona would always be my daughter, no matter who her biological father was. That bond, forged through love, was stronger than any twist of fate. And maybe one day, when the time was right, I'd tell her the truth. But until then, I would love her the only way I knew how by being there, in whatever capacity she needed, as her life unfolded in ways none of us could have ever predicted. After a difficult marriage and divorce, the protagonist, 31F, faces a tough decision about custody of her daughter, Ramona. Due to health issues and emotional strain, she chooses not to take full custody, allowing her ex-husband to care for their daughter. However, as her ex neglects Ramona, Child Protective Services intervene, and she is adopted by a loving couple. Over time, the protagonist remains a part of Ramona's life through regular visits, feeling a complex mix of guilt, love, and relief. Just as she begins to find peace, an unexpected revelation about Ramona's true biological father surfaces, leaving her with a secret that could change everything. Despite this, the protagonist vows to continue loving and supporting her daughter no matter what. 